Right, this talk is uh, about the problem of evil. Um, I shall be up front and tell you at the outset that um, I'm an atheist. I don't, I don't believe in God. Um, I'll be the first atheist that you uh, hear from today. Um, and I'm really just going to present you with what I hope will be an interesting and perhaps rather unusual way of thinking about the problem of evil, the evidential problem of evil. Have any of you heard me talk about the problem of evil before? Or read anything you have? Okay. Or read anything that I've written on the problem of evil? Okay, so one of you, one or two of you have heard some of this before, but most of you haven't, I believe, for me. Um, so I'll try, and, I'll try and introduce a few novelties for your benefit if you're, if you're familiar with it. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> let's get going. <clears throat> So, uh, if you're interested in this uh, topic, this, this was actually published as an academic paper in a journal called Religious Studies um, in 2010. And so you, can, you could actually read the original academic paper if you are interested. Um, or you could just email me and I'll, I'll send you a copy of it if you hunt me down on the, on the internet. <clears throat> So, uh, before I talk about the problem of evil, I just want to talk about reasonableness. Uh, it seems to me that beliefs can be more or less reasonable. Some beliefs are very reasonable indeed, others rather less reasonable. Some beliefs are downright unreasonable. Um, we could think about reasonableness as being a scale, if you like. Think of it as a vertical scale, with beliefs at the top being eminently reasonable. And then as you come down the scale, the beliefs become well, the less reasonable until when you reach the bottom of the scale, we're looking at the beliefs which are downright unreasonable. <clears throat> um, it seems to me that um, some beliefs certainly are very reasonable indeed. Uh, has, any, has anyone here been to Japan? You have? Wow, it's always a few. Three or four people have claimed to, claim, claim to have been to Japan. Um, I've never been to Japan. But I believe it exists, despite never having clapped eyes on it uh, myself. Um, why is that a reasonable belief for me to hold? Well, I have overwhelming evidence that Japan is a real place. You know, I've seen maps of the world in which it's marked a big island in the top left-hand corner of the Pacific Ocean. I've bought goods marked stamped made in Japan. Uh, Nintendo DS, my daughter recently, was clearly stamped made in Japan. Um, and I've met people who claim to come from Japan, and I've met people who claim to have visited Japan, such as you. Uh, so, every reason to believe that Japan is a real place. But of course, even though I have that evidence, there's always the possibility, no matter how remote, of my being mistaken about that. Um, <clears throat> did any of you watch a few years ago, possibly you're too, most of you are too young, but there was a program on Channel 4 called uh, Space Cadets, in which... Uh, some admittedly rather dim uh, young people were told that they were going to be travelling into space on a spaceship uh, from which they could view the Earth. They get to look out of the porthole and, and look at the Earth. And they went to, they were flown off to a, a space base somewhere uh, and shown like a, you know, a rocket ship and given training. It was supposed to be in Russia and they, they heard all these people talking in Russian and were given Russian sounding equipment to put on and so on. And it was a bit like Big Brother in space, really. Um, and it was, it was all a con. In the, there was no... It, they'd actually been flown to a big barn in Lowestoft. <laughs> Not Russia at all. Uh, and all of these, they were all actors, all of these people giving them the training and so on. <clears throat> and eventually they, they got it. There, there was lots of dry ice and they got aboard this spaceship, which wasn't really a spaceship at all. It was a flight simulator. And um, they were taken into space. And the finale of the programme, they got to take a spacewalk uh, and they stepped out of the, 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 um, the door of the spacecraft out into uh, a studio in front of a studio audience that uh, had been set up. And obviously it was an enormous joke at their expense. And some of them clearly bought it. Not all of them, but most of them did. Uh, the people that produced the programme went to such extra extraordinary and elaborate lengths that... Um, that they believed that they were in space. Um, now, why do I tell you that? Because it, it goes to show that sometimes 
Uh, even those things which we think you know, are perfectly obvious and clear to us, um, we can be mistaken about. You know, maybe Japan doesn't exist. You know? Maybe all of you people who claim to come from Japan or claim to have been there are all part of some elaborate CIA-led conspiracy to dupe Westerners. And in fact, that Nintendo DS was not uh, fabricated in Japan. Perhaps those people who claim to come from Japan just spend hours in makeup before I meet them. I mean, I don't know. You know is, is, is that likely? Highly, highly unlikely. But it is possible. Okay? So there's always the possibility of error. That's not to say that beliefs can't be eminently reasonable, nevertheless. Established beyond reasonable doubt. Um, as we come down the scale, towards the bottom of the scale, you, again you find beliefs such as you know, believing in Santa Claus and believing in fairies. Any, anybody? There's usually a one or two. No, not today. I'm too sensible for that. Okay. One or, th one or two people usually believe in fairies. I, I, it seems to me an eminently unreasonable thing to believe. It seems to me there's overwhelming evidence that there are no fairies, uh, that it's a lot of nonsense made up to amuse the children. Having said that, there's always the possibility of error. You know, maybe the fairies are down there at the bottom of the garden. Maybe they just live in deep underground bunkers and only come out at night. I don't know. There are all sorts of explanations you could cook up for why there's so very little evidence of fairies despite the fact that they're there. And then in the middle of the scale of reasonableness, you find beliefs which are you know, fairly reasonable, perhaps you know, not unreasonable. Belief that there is intelligence on other planets out there in the cosmos, in the universe, somewhere. Um, we've, no, we've got no direct evidence of any such intelligence, but on the other hand, we know that it has evolved on this planet, and we know that, oh dear, um, we know that there are literally billions of planets not unlike this one out there in the universe, so perhaps it's not unlikely that there is intelligence out there somewhere. So, you know, it's not an unreasonable thing to believe, but perhaps it's not that you know, very reasonable at this point to believe it. Beliefs change their position on the scale over time, depending on how much, for example, how much evidence we have available to us. So there's the scale of reasonableness, and now the question I want you to consider is this. Where does God exist uh, sit on the scale of reasonableness? I take it we're all agreed where, where, where the fairies are, down the bottom. We're all agreed where Japan is, close to the top. We're all probably agreed about ET somewhere in the middle. Uh, what about God exists? Um, does anyone, is anyone brave enough to say that they consider belief in God to be downright unreasonable, uh, near the bottom of the scale, perhaps even as low down as belief in fairies? Well, at least one person takes that view, the sort of Dawkinsian view, we might call it. No, it's more than one person, several people. Okay, um, who on the other hand would say that belief in God is, you know, not proved, but beyond all doubt, possible doubt, but you know, by no means unreasonable, really quite reasonable indeed. Maybe not quite as reasonable as believing in Japan, um, but no, not a million miles away from that. Definitely in the top half of the scale, reasonableness-wise. Does anyone want to? Yes, and again, quite a few people. And then in the middle of the scale, again, how, who would put your hands up for the, you know, about as reasonable as believing in ET or something like that? Good, OK. So the interesting thing is that whilst well, there's a consensus on Japan and the fairies, when it comes to God, suddenly there's disagreement, I mean, quite radical disagreement about just how reasonable this belief is. It's an interesting question why that should be so. I'm going to argue, uh, I'll give you an argument. It's merely a sketch. Um, <clears throat> I can't do much more than that in the time available. Just sketch out an argument for saying for drawing the conclusion that belief in God is pretty unreasonable. That's what I'm going to attempt to do now, OK? So, um, that was by way of introduction. The curse has disappeared. Where's it gone? I'll just press that instead. Did that work? Yes, OK. Um, so, the God I'm going to focus on, there are many God hypotheses we could consider. Uh, I'm just going to focus on the idea that there's an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good God, an omnipotent, omniscient, and supremely benevolent God of the sort that many monotheists believe in, if not all of them. Okay? It's that God, that kind of God that I'm going to focus on. As we've seen, many people believe that believing in a God like that is by no means unreasonable. If you ask them how reasonable it is, Christians will typically say, for example, 
Well, it's at least, you know, halfway up the scale of reasonableness. It's not like believing in fairies or Santa, oh no. It's much more reasonable than that. It may not be something we can prove or disprove either way, but in terms of reasonableness, it's at least halfway up the scale of reasonableness. It would be, it'd be kind of unusual. I've never met, I don't think, someone, possibly one person, who takes the view that it's really no more reasonable than believing in fairies, but yet they believe it. Uh, that would be quite an unorthodox position to take. Uh, and I've never met anyone <laughs> that took it. Those who believe, generally believe, consider themselves to hold the belief which is by no means unreasonable. And the question is, are they right uh, about that? And I'm going to suggest that possibly they're wrong. <coughs> Certainly we can't both be right. Um, so, um, first of all, notice that... Um, oops, gone too far. Notice that many of, most of, but certainly not all, we'll come, I'll come back to this later, the fact that there are some exceptions, but many of the standard arguments for the existence of God are not arguments for a good God, particularly at all. They are merely arguments for a first cause or a fine tuner, some kind of intelligence behind the universe that designed it, perhaps. Um, it's a huge further leap to the conclusion that this intelligence or first cause or prime mover or whatever it might happen to be um, is, say, supremely benevolent. Why draw that conclusion? The arguments by themselves give us no reason at all to draw that conclusion any more than they give us reason to draw the conclusion that the intelligence is, say, supremely evil. Uh, and who believes that? No one. So they are neutral on God's moral properties, many of these standard arguments for the existence of God. Many, I don't say all, but very many of them. Um, worse still, there's a powerful looking argument against the existence of God. Well, there are several actually, but I'm just going to focus on one. Oh dear. Hang on. It's all gone wrong. Um, there's the problem of evil. Uh, the problem, there are two problems of evil. If you're revising for your exams in philosophy of religion, you might want to make a note of the fact that there are two problems of evil. There's the logical problem of evil. The logical problem of evil is this. It says um, evil exists, and by evil here we mean uh, moral evils, the terrible moral things, morally wrong things that free agents do to each other, moral beings do to each other, but also you know, natural evils, pain, suffering, disasters, natural disasters and so on, those kind of evils. Now, it's claimed that if any evil at all exists, God does not exist, because an all-powerful God would be able to prevent evil from existing. Omniscience requires that he know that it exists, and his supreme benevolence means that he won't want it to exist, therefore there won't be any at all. So if there's any evil at all, there is no God. The existence of evil logically entails the non-existence of God. That's the traditional logical problem of evil as it's known. It doesn't matter how much evil there is, any evil at all, the suggestion is, any evil, any quantity whatsoever rules out the existence of God. Now that um, problem is not considered a particularly big problem in theological circles, and I don't consider it a particularly big problem actually. It seems to me that theists can get around this one fairly easily, um, they just have to say that, well, for example, um, there are certain evils which God will allow if that's the price that he has to pay for certain goods, goods that you can't have if you don't have those evils, um, and God will certainly want those goods, and indeed they more than outweigh the evils uh, that are required. So, for example, free will you might say is a very great good. We can't be free moral agents unless we're given free will, and God wants us to be free moral agents that do the right thing. Uh, as a the downside to that is that we'll choose to do evil, start wars and so on. Um, that's the price that God has to pay, unfortunately, in order for us to have this very great good of free will and doing good of our own volition and so on. And so that's why these evils exist. So you can explain evil to some extent in that kind of way. That's the logical problem of evil apparently dealt with. Um, that's not the problem that I'm concerned with here. Um, I'm going to look at a different problem called the evidential problem of evil. The evidential problem um, 
it, the amount now becomes critical. It's not the mere existence of some evil that's the problem, it's the quantity that matters. There's just way, way, way too much evil for this plausibly to be considered the creation of a all-powerful, all-knowing and supremely benevolent deity. He might allow for some, yes, but this much? Surely not. Uh, we can sharpen the problem up by saying that, you know, if there's a good God of the sort we're considering, he's not going to allow pointless or gratuitous, as it's sometimes known, evils to exist. If there's evil in the world, there's going to be a point to it, you know. Maybe it's the price paid for free will, or whatever it may happen to be. Um, there's going to be some explanation, even if we don't know what it is. There must be. There is not going to be pointless, gratuitous suffering in the universe if there is such a God. And when we look around us, we see so much pain and suffering that it just becomes implausible that it can all be somehow explained as or accounted for as the price paid for certain greater goods. There's just way, way too much of it. Um, you know, why cancer, the Holocaust, the Black Death and hemorrhoids I've frivolously added in order to try and lighten the mood. Uh, why would he crush, bury alive tens of thousands of children in the Pakistan earthquake of 2005? What was that all about? What was the greater good that was uh, obtained there? Um, and of course it's not just human beings that suffer. Um, the sentient inhabitants of this planet have been suffering on a literally unimaginable scale over hundreds of millions of years. Creatures that have evolved by natural selection to tear each other limb from limb in order to survive. Is this really the kind of universe that a supremely benevolent and all-powerful deity would create? Clearly not. Right? Clearly not. Why is it that human beings who've been on this planet for around about a million generations, why is it that for the vast sweep of human history, uh, around a third to a half of each generation of children have died before they even reach the age of five. <clears throat> uh, often in the most appalling and painful ways, disease, starvation, you know, a million generations before Jesus even shows up. What was that all about? Uh, what's the explanation for that then? So you might think that there is, on the face of it, overwhelming empirical evidence that if there is a creator behind the universe, perhaps there is, it is certainly not this one. <clears throat> it is certainly not a God who is all-powerful and all-knowing and all-good. So that is, I've just sketched out as powerfully and emotively as I possibly can, the, uh, the evidential problem of evil, so you kind of get the force of it, it is, on the face of it, an incredibly powerful objection to that kind of traditional theism. <clears throat> so, how might we deal with the evidential problem? It looks on the face of it to be powerful evidence against the existence of God. How might we respond to it? Any ideas? Yeah?